Hi everyone, Sleepy Soul here. In today's video, we're going to cover Diageo, but not just Diageo, we're going to cover luxury investments as a whole. Uh, there'll be some talk of uh, LVMH uh, and Hermes and uh, Cap uh, Capri uh, Holdings, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've pronounced that. Uh, and we're going to talk about kind of how to value the sector and, uh, or how to value Diageo specifically and, and, more, fo more focused on like where I think it's going to be a buy, uh, even though I did some of that work in a previous video. And then we're going to talk about kind of why I think the luxury sector in general is is kind of a do not touch until you see some massive pullbacks. Uh, so as as you can see, I kind of did some work on Diageo in a prior video uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so Diageo picked about $220 a share um, uh, late last year. I think it was... Uh, mid-November, uh, early November, it looks like, based on the chart. Uh, it announced that they're, they're – so Diageo doesn't deal with the end consumer. They just sell to their to, to the various uh, whiskey – or not whiskey, the various alcohol stores. And they announced in Central and South America that the sell-through numbers weren't as attractive or weren't as high as, as they thought. Stock drops from 160 down to 133. It's been on this very small volume uptrend uh, ever since. Uh, briefly broke below that in early January, popped back up, but it, it, it's it's it everything's sloping down and, and it seems very negative. Uh, and then I put more specifically, I, wrote, I drew these circles uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said these are your buy zones. If you want to, if you want to just make sure you get some shares, uh, you probably do your first half your buy somewhere between 133 and 125, and your second half is between 125, and it's supposed to be about 117 to 118, uh, but that, that's kind of the $7 range. Those those numbers correspond with historic reference points uh, to where the algorithms kind of step in. Um, so you basically, uh, the, the $100 bottom line, that's the line where, uh, that was the COVID bottom. It was also the bottom it made in 2016, uh, as well as 2015, as well as pretty close to the top it made in 2012. The, the all-time the top in 2012 was actually 105 dollars. So your your you know the 105 to 100 dollar mark is is, is long-term term support. Mid-term or, or the other long-term support line is this uh, 2013 high, uh, which is 117 ish dollars. Uh, it also hit that high in 2016, 2015. You can see that it was in this tight. 100 to 120 dollar channel for a while until 2018 uh it bought uh casamigos and that helped the revenue increase and, and their tequila brands did very well uh and caused the price to go up to 176 uh i think you're gonna at least see a dive back down to the 132 really the 127 dollar range um uh, before this resolves the upside i'm going to show you guys why in a second uh i think diageo uh, if you assume about eight dollars in earnings, uh, even eight fifty in earnings, uh, Diageo grows. Um, if using a dividend growth model, they they grow their dividend about five percent a year. That that means you should expect uh, a, a ten times multiple. I know that's not one to one. Uh, I, for those of you that use the dividend growth model, don't kill me for doing that. But uh, sorry, you should expect ten percent growth rate. So ten percent growth rate is 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 uh, means you want to trade at um, with eight dollars of EPS. You you denominate that a little bit lower because it's a UK stock, you probably get about 16 times earnings. So the dividend growth model is saying it's fairly valued. So the way you get that is, is um, uh, dividend growth model is uh, basically implying, uh, for those of you that don't know it, it's basically you take the amount of dividend growth and you, uh, you expect that's what EPS growth is going to be. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I did the math wrong there. So disregard all that. Uh, so, uh, what the dividend growth model is, is uh, you take the dividend growth rate and that's the expected growth rate of the following year. So for those that don't understand, if the dividend is growing at 5%, 5% is the expected growth rate for the following year. Okay. So the way, then you get to your multiple, you take five and again, the, just the general number is five times or whatever, whatever the growth rate, expected growth rate is times two, that's equal to 10. So you're 10 times next year's EPS. Uh, it's going to do about $9 and 20 cents at the high end of EPS next year. That's a $92 stock, uh, is a fair price to pay for this or put a different way. It's 50% over or a little more than 50% overvalued. Now, I don't think that's true. I want to be very clear. I'm just saying that that's what the dividend growth model would indicate, uh, that, that, that it's, uh, that, that it should be trading at an EPS number and it is, uh, it, uh, and then you just take the multiple and get that. I think it's fairer that this thing trades at about 
uh, 12 times EBIT to EBITDA. And it's currently at 14 times. Uh, EBIT is about $10, $11 a share. Uh, so again, five to 7% growth uh, is what their expected growth rate is for the next five years. And let's, let's cut that. Let's just take the midpoint, say six, six, uh, six times uh, EV over uh, and um, EBIT, uh, EV over EBIT uh, is, is 12. It gets you about $127 a share. So right in this zone. So that's how we get to our buy zone. So that's how we make the technicals line up with the fundamentals. Uh, you know, longer term buyers were buying back here a couple of years ago. We've seen all, you'll see all the froth, all this space. Uh, these bulls will get murdered. Uh, you allow them to finish selling and then, and then you step into a name that will appreciate over the next few years. But also, why am I so confident that, uh, that, that, that the alcohol sales aren't going to rebound instantaneously? Well, I'll tell you. Now this isn't a, exactly one for one, but this is a growth. This is a group everyone who does any luxury investing should be aware of. And luxury investing could just be not just the stocks, but you buy watches, you buy alcohol. I'm in. I I, I trade bourbon and wines for fun sometimes uh, v through various groups, uh, and and some people I know do it professionally. So I, I sometimes have access to things that I wouldn't normally get. But this is a group that that basically puts together a report and is probably close to the premier. Uh, in terms of what is going on in the various luxury goods market. Uh, there is the Rolex index. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, Knight Frank is a group out of the UK. And they basically put this very in-depth report. Where they, I mean, now they've recently been talking about NFTs, uh, but they talk mostly about art and what's like what part pieces of art are appreciating. Um, you know, what are the like for example, what are the top uh, vintage Rolex models? What are the the best rare whiskey and handbags? Uh, you know, what are the uh, what are trends are driving the art market? Uh, classic cars, NFTs. Now this is from Q2 of 2023. I think they put one out every six months because it's UK based, so it's not every quarter like ours is, uh, like the American. Is, but this is pretty interesting. So this is uh, the investment index. Uh, so similar to what the Rolex index does, they take a selection of various things and, and it's the price movement of the items uh, over the past 12 months and past 10 years. So the green box is 10 years. As you can see, everything's up crazy with bourbon and specifically scotch. This is scotch. So that's more appropriate to Diageo, which is why I'm bringing this up instead of the bourbon index I, I follow. Um, uh, rare bottles of scotch is up 322%. Uh, over the last decade. Now, when I say rare bottles, these are often not bottles you, you, the end the viewer of this video could actually buy. And I'm not even talking about from an affordability perspective. Like I have uh, close to 30 bottles of unopened uh, Jim Beam decanters uh, from the 1960s. Uh, there, there, there's some lead issues, so they don't go for very expensive. But I also have uh, glass bottles of bourbon from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Those are drinkable. Like I could, I, we could open one and drink it and it provides a different taste and texture because again, it's been in their bottle for potentially longer than double some of the people watching this video's lifetimes. Uh, I bring that up because like these bottles do not get sold. Like you can't walk into an alcohol store and buy it. You either need to know someone or you need to know a specialty shop that deals with it. Um, for bourbon specifically, there's a place in, in North, uh, Northern Kentucky called revival spirits, uh, that does rare, rare bourbons and occasionally scotches. They also, I think to have some tequila as well, but, um, but there are other, uh, but there are, there are publicly facing shop that you can walk in. Prices are a little bit higher than you'd pay on, on, uh, uh, uh you know, if you knew a private collector, uh, because you obviously the guy's got to make a buck. Uh, his name's Brad who, who owns the shop. He's a really nice guy, but like, he's one that can deal in this stuff. If you go into a, uh, you go into a watch shop and you're buying high end watches, like you're often going to like the diamond, uh, the diamond district in New York for these like very specific items that you're going getting walked into a vault with armed security guards to talk about. Like these are not items you just go walk in and say, Hey, I want to buy this 1973 Rolex. Uh, they got to source it. And, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to point out, but the 10 year price target with the exception of diamonds, which uh, we'll mention in a second has been relatively good. Uh, they've all pretty much uh, watches and wine have mostly kept pace with the S&P 500 bourbon and whiskey or rare whiskey bottles have, have, have almost doubled it. Everything else is done uh, slightly below the market, uh, which is fine. But most notably are these blue boxes. I want to point out 
Art's appreciated 30%. Most of that's related to NFTs um, and, and new wave artists. People are trying to get in, uh, you know, to the newest Banksy trends before Banksy blow the next Banksy blows up. You know, watches and jewelry did 10%. That was okay. The rest of the, the rest of the industries did below S and P 500 returns, but notably, rare whiskey did negative 4%. And part of that, and 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 we can. You know, you can read Drink the Drink Business, which is a, an industry magazine for those of you that are in the industry or those of you that aren't in industry. It's a great website to talk about uh, different uh, uh, different alcohols and, and how the different trends are growing. They actually spotted the beer pullback before really any other indus- uh, really any other magazines did. So they're really good. Uh, and they kind of talk about this report and they talk about how, you know, the price trades changes of investment grade alcohol. This is this is literally from the night uh, the night Frank report. But it's just more alcohol specific, so it doesn't. It, I don't have to go looking for it. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Italian wines did six percent growth. The U.S. Uh, alcohols did uh, twelve or wines did twelve percent, but everything else was negative. Uh, now they're not showing uh, Australia, and I think if I'm not mistaken, Spanish wines or Argentinian wines did okay as well. Argentina is kind of Argentina is kind of a different beast. Uh, but but a lot of going back to Diageo, a lot of Diageo's uh, problems are twofold. One. Um, uh, it's it's the high spirits, which is which is whiskey. Tequila is doing great, but but beer is uh, weak. Uh, I think the average beer drink, the average uh, in um, beer is down, uh, volume is down like five to twelve percent, depending on what brands you're talking about. Bud Light is obviously the big notable. 500 pound gorilla because of what happened with the politics and and the transgender stuff, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but uh, again, they they. The the issue with the rare whiskeys is everyone is coming out with the rare whiskey. An easy way to come out with a rare whiskey is just have a long age statement. So if you buy like a bourbon that is aged 20 years, like Poppy Van Winkle, uh, or, uh, or what's the other one? Um, Old Fitz, uh, the decanter bottles, or uh, there's an Evan Williams 18, or not an Evan Williams, uh, Elijah Craig 18 year, which is like a mid tier, higher end bottle. Um, uh, Woodford put out a 16 year age statement. Uh, Four Roses does a blended bottle that now uh, their most recent one had about 18 years in it. So like just having larger age statements makes the bottle rarer because just not as much alcohol makes it there because of natural or the angel share, which is natural evaporation. And because of that, uh, the, there is there is a larger increases in rare whiskeys or bourbons. I'm using bourbon because I'm more familiar with bourbon uh, than I am scotch. I'm not a huge scotch guy. Barley uh, kind of screws me a little bit. Um, like in terms of I get drunker, I get more drunk faster. Uh, so I, I tend to stick with rye and uh, weeded, uh, rye weeded uh, and corn based uh, spirits. So uh, but putting that aside, in my own personal alcohol preferences aside. The, the 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 issue with scotch is there's uh, the the dark ages of bourbon were from like 1960 when vodka uh, got uh, kind of um, what's the phrase got deregulated to about the mid 90s so all of the stuff that is 30 years to 60 years old is now f- in private collectors hands and it's either getting opened remember every year there's just less of these bottles because while like all these bottles aren't getting opened every day of like hey my grandson is born i'm gonna pop open this bottle and we're gonna have this hey my son is born i'm gonna pop open this bottle we're gonna have this hey i'm retiring i'm gonna pop open this bottle we're gonna have this these events happen and people open these bottles and they're just gone from the from circulation so there is become a uh, uh, that is why the that is why the value shoots up. But the problem is with there is now this newer wave of premier bottles showing up that the value on the higher end is lowering. So what does that all have to do with Diageo? You're sitting here going sleepy. The Diageo sells like Johnny Walker Blue. That has nothing to do with uh, any uh, with all this stuff. Well, there was a mini whiskey boom and a mini, mini scotch boom during the COVID, uh, and obviously you see that reflected in the share price, right? You know, share price basically doubled, uh, and and really the the, uh, the the this this doubling was the whiskey and scotch boom, and beer boom. Uh, less so tequila. Tequila is more of a going out and party drink, and that's uh, Casamigos is seeing explosive growth. So that's a fantastic piece of Diageo's business. But more specific, more broadly, uh, as 
the premier whiskeys look less of a collectible item as there's less of a collectability from it that is going to force prices lower throughout the system because if i am only willing to pay 10 to 12 dollars a year per or, or 20 to 12 dollars per year per age statement so the way that works is on a 20 year bottle i'm willing to pay 200 to 240 plus tax but i be but during uh like in, and that's like right now but like back here uh, in like 2022 or 2021, I'm willing to pay 12 to $18 that that is going to flow through the system and it's going to involve, uh, require alcohol, especially more expensive alcohol where the higher margins are to sit on shelves longer. And if they're sitting on shelves longer, that means the, the distributors are not selling or not buying as much from the, from the wholesalers or not buying Diageo's product. So that's why there's this problem in Central America is the prices are not where the value needs to be because Diageo's alcohol, like every other alcohol company, raised prices in 2020, early 2023 and late 22. Their prices went up, but but there was such a flood to the market uh, because there's just less people drinking that the stock price went down. Okay, now let's talk real quickly about GLP ones and Novo and Eli Lilly and the and the Gen Zers not drinking alcohol. I think that's all going to be noise. That's going to be like if when you start hearing Diageo is basically a structural zero because Gen Z people uh, aren't drinking. Listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. I will am willing to put a lot of money on the line at some point in the next two years that the that there is going to be a cultural pivot away from weed and back towards alcohol and smoking. And the reason is alcohol and smoking are social vices. You go out and you do them with friends or you do them like with your spouse and uh, at, at a restaurant. You do not do that with weed. Weed is a solo entity. Weed does not get you laid. Uh, you can make an argument. Cocaine does. Weed does not get you laid uh, uh, more broadly, to, but like alcohol does. Uh, smoking does. And that's for men and women, right? Like you, you lower your inhibitions for both men and women. You find someone you're willing to spend time with and Hey, that person turns out to be your wife or husband. So I think there is going to be a cultural sometime in the next two years, you're going to see that Gen Z pushback or, or, or pendulum start to swing away from weed and towards alcohol. Uh, and I think you're, you're already starting to see that some of the side effects of alcohol or, or, a rapid weed use is, you know, uh, and again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Don't hold me to this stuff, but is, is, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if it's even called schizophrenia or any other thing or multiple personalities, but there seems to be some brain issues. So like, you're going to start hearing more about that in the meantime, Diageo is going to fall. Hopefully when they make their earnings in early February, that is a buy in the mid one twenties. Okay. Let's talk more. Uh, so that's Diageo. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Again, uh, Google just this night Frank uh, uh, report. It's really interesting. Um, you know how they talk about again. Here's the here's the message in the bottle part. Uh, you know here's uh, like you know again. Rolex is up 10%. Cartier is up 12%. Uh, Petit Philippe is up 7%. You know car changes. Uh, Ferrari's down 15%. Mercedes Benz down 10. Porsche is down five. Uh, uh, Old school BMWs are up nine and Lamborghinis are up nine. Uh, and, you know, they talk about art. It's it's a really, really cool, cool, cool piece of, of, of just cultural awareness and where prices are going to go up. And, you know, uh, the, the awesome part about it is you, it really explains and it talks about like how – uh, how this stuff gets popular and like where it's, how it's popularity is it, uh, cause they often talk to collectors and they talk about like why people are, are, are going to one brand versus the other. And, uh, you know, like for example, ownership of classic cars by age group boomers own over 50% gen Xers own 28%, uh, pre boomers own 12. So that's the greatest generation. Those are, you know, for most people listening, it's either grandpa or great grandpas, millennials and gen Zers only own 7%. So this becomes like, when you're talking about classic cars, this becomes a discussion of like, do you think millennials and gen Zs will start eating into these as cars hit auction and get to, um, uh, and, and they, and they make more money. Or do you think that these people, as they sell their classic car collections, the price of classic car is going to go down and they're, uh, to allow for millennials and Gen Z's to buy. So if you own a classic car, that's a big discussion. It's, do you wait till prices fall or do you, uh, or 
would you, uh, in the anticipation that millennials and Gen Zs are just not going to spend as much money on it? Or do you think they're willing to buy it because there's a dwindling amount of classic cars and you buy it? Uh, you, you're, you're willing to buy some stake up, stick it in, stick it in a nice, uh, uh, nice garage, uh, and and then leave the car there for five years till it appreciates. I'm going to tell you on a personal note. I went to a classic car auction. I think two or three months ago at this point. It was like late October, and uh, late October, early November. I can't remember the exact date. And I'll tell you, the prices seemed outrageous for what they, people were buying. Um, and it didn't. It seemed like a, a large number of them didn't hit their minimum. So my guess, my sense is on the classic car market specifically that the direction that the price is going to go down. Um, watch list again. Uh, you know they 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 use similar to Rolex. They have a specific selection of watches and they watch to appreciate. We'll talk about watches in one second. Uh, they talk about EVs, how Porsche and Lamborghini are spending a lot of money uh, uh, to, uh, to Porsche, Lamborghini and Ferrari are spending a lot of money to make high end electric vehicles. Uh, and then they um, uh, uh, then they talk about art. And again, like, you know, again, the like what is popular in art, um, you know, get private collector for these interesting hand-drawn arts this uh 19 or this 17th century gold ruby glass uh this uh, this girl on the beach painting you know some statues uh and kind of what's moving in the art world again this is just kind of interesting it's just an interesting piece of like cultural awareness like you you know you, you don't want you don't buy this stuff uh uh, they, they, you don't buy, you don't read this to be like, oh, what do I need to buy? You read this because it's just interesting. And again, this is the section on whiskeys. They talk about basically how there's a lot of there was a lot of new money flowing there, and then how uh, how that money is now uh, kind of leaving the market because it's just not the hot thing. Basically, Beanie Babies, like the Beanie Baby bull, uh, bull run is over. Uh, now we just kind of sit. And again, you, if you want to buy whiskeys now, is probably starting the time to look into. Uh, look into buying them. So anyways, that's, that's the whiskey piece. Uh, let's go in to talk about LVMH. So I made some headline or not headlines, but I got a lot of pushback. Uh, I'm going to use the OTC shares. Uh, so I apologize. Oh, this is the wrong one. It's why, uh, I'm going to use the OTC shares just because, uh, fine. We can use the France, French ones. That's what those came up. Okay. So these are the, this is LVMH. Okay. So if you notice, it's a similar chart, uh, similar ish chart. This is the French denominated or Euro denominated currency. Just so you're aware. Uh, let's just make some quick lines here. Do, 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 do. Uh, so this is the, uh, is that the pre-COVID high? Yeah, it's the pre-COVID high. So this is LVMH, which is the conglomerate that makes a lot of various handbags. I, I don't know off the top of my head every brand they have, so I'm just not even going to bother talking about that. But I will say this. Uh, so this article passed uh, my head, uh, uh, across my desk this morning. Um, diamond prices slashed by 25% as lab grub gems rock the industry. And it's about D bears basically having to cut prices, uh, north of 25% for the stones that end up in jewelry and engagements, because there's just not as much market for that because people are buying lab grown. That's going to continue having an effect on all, uh, diamond based jewelry. And that's important for LVMH because, uh, depending on what you want to look at it, 9% of their uh, revenues come from jewelry and about two thirds of that is related to diamond based product. So somewhere between 6% of their revenue and 8% of their revenue, depending again, how, how much you want to give to tag Hewitt, which their watch brand, uh, is, is applicable to, to the diamond market. Again, similar ish chart to, to, to though a little bit more, it's been a little bit more supportive than Diageo, but similar thing like it bottoms in COVID, uh, at, you know, 300 Euro per share. Uh, basically rises straight up and now it's starting to give that back. Now you can make an argument that it might reach this October 21 uh, uh, price at 500, which is still 20% uh, to the downside, or it's going to go to where before it blew up in 2020. Uh, it's going to go another, another to the 30% to the downside to 438 ish euros. Uh, so anyways, I made some, uh, some people got upset on Twitter when I said, you really can't buy LVMH unless it's 25 to 30% below here, or basically put another way in this buy zone, 
This is your buy zone for for LVMH. And again, this is the French version. I was going to pull up the the the, the OTF uh, uh, OTC um, American ver uh, ADR, but this works just as fine. Um, the, that one's a little bit more pronounced in terms of the, the, the bubble coming out. But you just need to figure out is are they are they going to sell it down to this 525? Are they going to sell it down to 435? Are they going to sell it back to the 300 level? But again, 6% of your revenue is going to get impacted. You're going to say sleepy, but that means margins are going to go up because the input costs are down. Yes, but what people aren't, aren't going to be willing to pay is, uh, you know, you go to like Van Cleef and um, – Oh, what's the other one? Van Cleef and I can't remember the other part of their name. It's Van Cleef and something. Uh, like you go to these high end uh, stores that do, um, uh, you know, you know, like like Bulgari. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, Chamat, Chamat. You know, you, these they, they focus on high end jewelry. If people feel like the diamond they're getting is now not now going to be a lab grown and going to cost, you know, a three carat diamond, for example, a three carat uh, round cut, a good a good cut, a fire diamond cost uh, a few years ago, and I'm not even talking about COVID prices. This is like like early COVID, pre COVID prices would have cost somewhere in the realm of thirty five ish grand wholesale, uh, maybe even as low as thirty or twenty eight thousand. But let's say it was twenty eight thousand as the low end. Uh, twenty-eight thousand dollars at the low end of, of a three-carat round fire cut, like like uh, you know maybe a very slight uh, or VS uh, color is is probably somewhere in the E to F range, right? Like that's that's kind of what you're looking at in terms of cost. That same diamond that's a lab grown is going to cost like somewhere around three thousand to four thousand dollars. So it's literally one tenth the cost. So like if you're shopping for diamond jewelry and you know, you're buying a three carat diamond necklace for your, your wife and it's 50 grand and you're going to like, Hey, is this a lab grown diamond? Yes. Well then what the fuck is this 50 grand for that gold chains costs $150 and the lab grown costs three to five grand. And you're going to say, well, sleepy, they're rich. They don't care. You'd be surprised. Like the, the way that the way high end jewelry works is the perception becomes the reality. And if people, if it, becomes part of the commonly accepted truth that high end or that diamonds are now heading down diamond jewelry has to follow suit whether you're buying something at the local place in in new england at ross simon or you're buying something on michigan avenue or not michigan avenue uh yeah michigan avenue or the diamond uh district in new york or chicago or you're buying something uh on uh the champs Elysees in paris like it does not matter where you're shopping Every once it becomes part of common knowledge and it is entering it. That's why this article is so important is diamond prices are just heading down. The price of jewelry will quickly follow. It won't follow immediately. So there will be a period of time that the revenue looks better, uh, that the EP, the earnings power looks better, but the market will quickly sm sniff that out, look through it and send the stock price lower. So that is, that is one issue. The second issue is aspirational buyers. As I'm sure most of you have seen, there's been all those videos of, 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 well, I'm not trying to make a sexist thing, mostly women because they're recording themselves uh, getting laid off. Uh, you can make the argument that it's not just women, it is men. The, a lot of people have laptop jobs and these laptop jobs were low stress, uh, low uh, low difficulty and high high compensation, uh, that mostly in tech, if we're being real honest. And a lot of those tech jobs are just going away. They're, they're either, they're going away in the sense that like, they're just not going to pay as much for the low quality of work they're doing. A lot of those low quality work, 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 uh, Employees were the people that were buying uh, Rolexes for men or high end uh, or the aspirational like the Fendi bag for women. And all of that stuff uh, helps uh, helps prop these these um, uh, the, these uh, luxury goods makers higher. The, the argument they're going to make is, hey, China's coming back online. The Chinese, cons Chinese consumer is a big portion. It li literally is. For the leather and leather goods, it's, it literally is either North America or China, depending on uh, what quarter you're talking about in terms of number one uh, areas. And then Japan is usually number three uh, because the Asians love high-end items. But the, the that is that is kind of something that is going to be a three- to five-year bull case. So what I think is going to happen with LVMH is it's going to trade down to this 520 mark, then decide where it's going to go, 
and uh, here, let me pull, uh, again this is the this is the European euro it's going to decide where it's going to go and that could either be down or it could be back up but I think you, you really don't want to buy it until it's at least uh, below 560 which is again materially lower we're talking about a stock that's about somewhere between 18 to or 15 to 18 percent lower than it is today before it becomes interesting enough to buy I, I don't have a position in this. I'm not short this. I want to be very clear. I don't really care where it goes. If it just goes higher, it's just not a stock I'm going to buy. But you, you start needing to get into this idea that that really, that, that again, there's probably going to be some EPS growth like in this period, which is basically COVID till today uh, or really till mid through this year, till 2025, there's going to be some ne uh, general EPS growth that's going to stay with the company. But really you need to work with this, uh, work with the company with, with, uh, to do the math on it is you got to take the EPS that it was in back here and then just multiply it by the share count reduction, which if I'm not mistaken with LVMH is, is, is relatively de minimis. I think it's down like the float is down like 3% maybe over the last, it's about a percent a year, if I'm not mistaken. So you do that and you're like, okay, where was EPS in 2019? X dollars. Multiply by one point, let's call it 1.7. That's really then you got to start discussing like, okay, do I think the multiple expansion should be correct? And, and I think that just the, like the, there's a lot of investors, a lot of especially newer investors um, have seen this explosive growth and whether it's race with Ferrari, whether it's Hermes, whether it's LVMH, they've seen this explosive growth. They see that all the girls around them or guys around them are wearing Rolexes or high end watches and high end handbags. And they go, Hey, I want to be invested in this market. And Hey, it's coming down. It's getting a little cheaper. It's not, at it's all time high. Again, it's down like 20% already from it's all time high. But what you really need to think about, and I know this because I, I, I literally have, I have friends that have been invested in this, these stocks, this LVMH did nothing for two decades. Okay. In 20, August of 20, uh, we had friends buy it in 2013 or 2011, excuse me. They paid the, the equivalent of 126 euros. Okay. It was 120, 136 euros in July of 16. So it did not appreciate basically for five years. If you bought at the September 20 high at looks like 98 or 97 euros, you saw 20% appreciation over two decades almost. OK, it wasn't until 2016, 2017 when things started really taking off. Now, it has done great since then. You can make the argument that the 200 week moving average is probably the place to buy because it's found support there. But I think I think this is going to drop below it because I just think structurally. And again, I bring back the uh, I bring back the 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 night Frank market. What is happening in whiskey right now with prices decreasing is going to pull down the entire high-end uh, collectible market with the exception of art and art's always a different beast because it's non-zero chance it might be money laundering so the the rest of the market is still pulling back and, and again you know this is happening because on the six-month chart of the rolex index we're down almost 10 percent so you know while they're not one for one, they're showing watches over ten over uh, a twelve month period going up. And again, this is just Rolex. This isn't other brands. But Rolex goes for for the last six months went from twenty seven eight to twenty six one. So it's down about eight uh, percent. Uh, yeah, eight percent over the last uh, eight, six percent of the six month and eight percent on the one year. I'm sorry, I'm look, I can find them right here. I didn't even notice they were right there on the right. On a five-year basis, like if you told me this was a stock chart, you know the place to go long? It would be this September 6th high of 21000 $21, which is $5,000 lower or 20% lower. All signs in the luxury market are pointing to we are, we are past peak bubble and we are coming out of it. It is not a pretty picture. That does not mean you can't own these stocks. You want to buy them and just forget about them for 20 years? Yeah, you might make, you'll, you'll make the dividend at least, and that's two to 3%, depending on which one you're buying. But it, it is just, you don't need, if you don't need to own it, why are you, why are you trying to chase this falling knife? Let there be a liquidation event. Let there be this massive red candle where longer term holders are liquidating and the algorithms find a level they like it at, and then you buy it. And then it becomes attractive. 
okay? Uh, the last one I want to talk about, I was going to talk, uh, let's talk about Capri Holdings. So this is another uh, company. Now they have an offer for, I think, $57, $50.66 right now. Uh, uh, the deal is likely to close. Uh, this is an ARB play. The deal is likely to close sometime in Q3 or Q4. Uh, you're basically getting, let's call it, let's call it $6.50 upside. Uh, cause you don't get a dividend, unfortunately, uh, $6 and 50%, 650 upside. It's, so it's about a 12% return. If it closes in July, that's a run rate of 25%. If it closes in October, it's a run rate of 15%, just to give you guys the different value spreads. If it closes in December. It's 12, it's 12%, right? Um, I said 15% up for October. Yeah. So that's, you know, uh, China just approved the deal. That wasn't a big risk for them. It's it's really America. I think the deal goes through. Uh, I think the deal actually goes through for, faster than the market expects. I would like to see. I would really like to see this trade below fifty dollars to buy it. Now it is as it hasn't traded that this year. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Friday the 5th. Oh, it has traded that below $50 this year, barely, um, on Thursday. I would like to see at least one day of below $50 on not deal news breaking or not deal news about to break, but just like a grind lower with the general market. So if the market sells off in February and this gets to $48, that makes the potential upside on a one-year basis, uh, what, almost $10, $10 over 40, or let's call it $9, $9 over 48 is is almost 20%, just below 20%. That becomes very attractive to me. I think that becomes the, like, put 20% of your portfolio in there and, you know, just don't put it on margin and just kind of let it sit and, and you'll be happy the deal goes through. Now, if it falls because of news breaking, that's a different story or if news is about to break. But if it's just general market risks, like Apple sells off, 15% one day. I don't think it'll ever do that, but Apple sells off 6%. So the whole market goes down. This is probably a stock you want to look at. Okay. Uh, you know, and this is one, again, uh, not really an options guy, but you could probably sell puts and then, uh, use the money to buy calls and, and, you know, you could play around with that, uh, figure out if that, uh, lowers or increases your, your potential returns. But that, this is, this is probably the R play after spirit and jet blue, uh, for the year. But anyways, this has been sleepy soul. Uh, this is my piece on, um, uh, on, on high end luxury investing. Uh, again, I, I just think we're, 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 we're coming out of a bottle bubble. The one that's most attractive to me is again, outside of Capri, which is the, uh, our play is Diageo. I really think you just got to wait until you get to the mid twenties, which it, I think it will get there. Uh, it just feels, uh, it feels very heavy on, on green days. It barely moves up on red days. It, it, it kind of gets, it gets aggressive to the downside. It's also a UK stock and there's UK BS on there too. But anyways, uh, keep an eye on these. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions down below. I'm, I'm sure this will be a, uh, be a fun thing to talk about and I will talk to you all soon. Peace.